this morning is Cindy Frizzell. Cindy's a national team leader for fire prevention education teams, also serves as a PIO at Wildfire Incidents Nationwide. She's also worked as an education coordinator for Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River, the Virginia Project Learning Tree Coordinator and a fire prevention educator for the Virginia Department of Forestry. Her background also includes work as a park ranger for federal, state, and historical parks, including New Market Battlefield. She has an undergraduate degree in forest resource management from Virginia Tech, go Hokies. Also, and Cindy, go ahead and hold up your mug again so we can see your pottery work. Cindy is a has a home pottery stu studio in her home in Woodstock, Virginia. She's a licensed vendor uh, to make Smoky Bear Pottery as Bear Tree Company. And she's also the owner of Ember, a future fire prevention canine. So is Ember there with you as well? He is not. Morning. I think the <laughs> other <girl> outside. Okay. <laughs> And Evelyn Morgan, you can now see Evelyn on there. And Evelyn is retired from the Forest Service, Daniel Boone National Forest. She's a graduate of Moorhead State University. She started her career with Kentucky State Parks as a cave guide and recreation director. Evelyn's career with the Forest Service included conservation education and managing a visitor center where she did a lot of fire prevention work. And of course, she's been actively involved in prevention for many years. And this is not on her bio, but she also owns a quilt store there in Grayson, Kentucky, an active quilter and uh, stays very busy quilting and doing a lot of quilting projects for folks. So, and then Karen Stafford is here with us in Nashville and Karen graduated from Stephen F. Austin State University in 2003 with her Bachelor of Science degree in Forest Management, and then graduated in 2011 with her Master's of Science in Fire Management. She's worked for the Texas A&M Forest Service for 23 years and has been a part of the Mitigation and Prevention Program uh, for the past 18 years. She's currently the statewide Fire Prevention Coordinator and also a member of the International Society of Arbor Culture and holds a Certified Arborist designation Okay, good deal. And now I don't have Amber or Ember's bio, but <laughs> Ember's on. So uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll, Cindy, if you want to go ahead and go first, uh, we'll we'll go. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, okay. Um, let me share this. I wasn't sure if I was. So. Okay. Um, okay. Am I sharing my screen? It's coming. Wrong thing. It's, can you see anything? Just a white screen right now. Can you see anything now? <laughs> Corner number, out, there we go. Right. You see my presentation. <laughs> Not yet, it's just showing a, a white screen. Cindy, I've got it up and ready to share if you want me to share my screen. Yeah, you go ahead, you go ahead. Okay, and and Cindy, I have it also if you need me to run it from here. Yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, Evelyn. Oh, well, no, I've got, I, this is Steph, Cindy, I've got, Oh, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My, is it showing? I've got it that it's. See something. Yes. Yes, I can see it. Yes. Great. Oh, okay, so perfect. Whenever you're ready. 
thing like practicing and getting ready and having everything and then you know <laughs> so anyway okay so we'll go ahead and start um i have invited stephanie chapman to join us as a co-presenter because she was on this assignment with me but um stephanie you should go ahead and introduce yourself i'm stephanie chapman I work as the interpretive specialist on the George Washington and Jefferson National Forests. I'm duty stationed on the Lee Ranger District, and I've been working with Cindy for many, 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 many years in fire prevention. And um, we, we've gone out on a couple details over the last few years to um, out west. And so um, I'm excited to, to be here and talk about Sequoia National Forest. Excellent. Hey, slide. Feel free to contact us. Time about anything. Um, we were, we fell into this incredible experience in California last fall, and um, it was giant soil emergency response. And in documents, I have placed final report. Cindy, your good. sound is really, really bad. Is it really bad? Ah, oh, shoot. I'm not really sure what to do about that. That was okay. better. Is that better? Okay, I'll move the, I don't know if I'll move the computer. Oh, you know what? I have a, I forgot my Bluetooth thing was in my ear. Does it sound better? Yes. Okay. I forgot. I had the Bluetooth in my ear. I think so you're thank getting you. feedback. Now we're getting feedback. No, you're sounding good now. Okay. You were, okay. You were getting feedback earlier, I think. Yeah. Good we deal. have too many doodads, <laughs> don't we? But thank you, Andy, for texting me about the microphone possibility. So um, everybody's here to support us. But if you would like to see the final report, we put it on um, Robin's documents and if you would like to see anything else we talk about today or have access to any of our products just let us know because i haven't put any of this stuff on the anywhere else so okay next slide stephanie okay the a national team was called kind of in a roundabout way uh, because they were actually looking for public information officers. She wanted to bring in like 13 public information officers and there were none available because of other things going on. And um, so uh, Stephanie was called about becoming a public information officer and she suggested a national fire prevention team. And we were coming on call and we wanted to make sure, you know, they ordered the one that was on call. So we went out and introduced them to the concept of the fire prevention teams. They kept calling us the information team when we first got there and we kept having to remind them, we are a national fire prevention team. So they were able to learn about what we are, what we did, and it turned around really wonderfully. Uh, we were there from August 9th through 26th. We had a variety of specialties. We set up our team to be able to do just about anything they needed, including photography, videography, graphics, interpretive services. We had a Forest Service agency administrator because it's a highly political situation, writing, marketing, planning for media and public tours, web page design, social media. And we had members from Virginia, Texas, New Mexico, and Florida. Okay, next slide, and Stephanie's going to talk about this part. Well, because this was sort of an unusual um, activity for a fire prevention team, uh, or non-traditional, I should say, the first thing we had to do was learn our resource. And so we needed to understand why giant sequoia trees were special. And the giant sequoia tree is a member of the cypress family. It's the largest tree in the world. Giant sequoias are found only in a very limited area within the Sierra Nevada mountains. Giant sequoias are some of the oldest and largest trees on Earth, and they are uniquely adapted to thrive in their environment. And one term that we, we threw around quite a bit was the term monarch, and the monarchs are considered to be the largest and oldest giant sequoias. 
Now we get to the fire prevention component. Giant sequoias play a, a, a crucial role in the giant sequoia e ecosystem. Giant sequoias are adapted to periodic fire. Sequoia bark typically protects trees against significant damage. Fire also prepares the bare mineral soil and required by the sequoia seeds for germination. But the times they are a changing. For over 3000 years, giant sequoia have been accustomed to frequent low severity fires. Fire exclusion over the last 150 years has led to extreme fuel accumulation in these giant sequoia groves that were accustomed to frequent low severity fires. Expansive tree mortality from 2017, the 2017 drought, along with recent wildfires has meant the loss of nearly 20% of all giant sequoia groves. This has left the giant sequoia groves extremely vulnerable to high severity fire. Giant sequoia trees are extremely fire tolerant and therefore they were thought to survive all fires. So my experience with this area, I went and uh, to California in about 2015 and led a fire prevention team for the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and actually got to go into some of the really pristine areas of the Thule River Reservation, which is right next to this national forest. And the trees were amazing. The, the river, the, oh, it was just amazing. You went from desert to this forest. And then I drove up through the national parks, the, the um, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, and just had an incredible experience, cried the whole way through. And then when we went back in 2020, after all of the fires, I cried for other reasons. It was devastating, the number and acres of forests that were destroyed, destroyed. And, um, in 2015, a few monarch sequoias were killed in high severity portion of the rough fire. 2017, a few more were ki killed in the pier fire. Then in 2021, the windy fire and the KNP complex burned about 5% of the monarch giant sequoias. The remaining unburned groves and portions of unburned groves are under severe threat of wildfire and lightning strikes are a constant problem. And so they felt that immediate action was needed to remove fuels around these trees to limit further mortality. And there was there was a bill going through Congress or, or thinking about going through about save the sequoias, but it, the timing was not good enough. So on July 22nd, 2022, the US Forest Service Chief Randy Moore initiated the Giant Sequoia Emergency Response. GSER to expedite the implementation of 13,000 acres of fuel reduction treatments in 12 giant sequoia groves on the national forest. Of course, the objective of the emergency response is to reduce catastrophic wildfire risks that currently threatens the, the sequoias. And there was one grove in Sierra National Forest 11 groves in Sequoia National Forest where they wanted to immediately do some work. An emergency response is an unusual activity on national forests. It, we had never heard of it. It's only done in, in an extreme emergency when work needs, needs to be done immediately. When the emergency was when the emergency was declared, they also got funding to do the project. And the, the chief of the Forest Service was from California, so he knew of the, the severe conditions that were happening. So he had firsthand experience. Um, and we also brought on an agency administrator to our team to help with educating the public and the media, because this is jumping right into a project where they're going out and cutting trees and brush and without you know, interacting with the public first. It's an emergency response. So they they knew that there was going to be a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, and uh, that's why they were in need of all those 13 information officers to work with the media. But they got us, and that was even better. Okay, next, Stephanie's going to do this part. 
Of the 37 giant sequoia, sequoia groves found on national forest system lands in California, all except five have burned or partially burned in recent wildfires. And an unprecedented number, 20% of giant monarchs were killed. The giant sequoia trees are extremely fire tolerant and therefore, again, they thought would survive most fires. In the 11 groves chosen on the Sequoia National Forest for the emergency response work, each grove had a site-specific prescription that guided what work needed to be done. No large, that means greater than 20 inch green trees were cut. Most of the trees that were felled and removed from the grove were smaller trees that had taken over portions of the groves in the absence of fire. Hand crews were used for the work conducted around the monarchs. And the, these hand crews really formed the backbone of our fire prevention and education program. Answering the call, um, right after, immediately after the, the Forest Service Chief signed the emergency response, we had boots on the ground. By August 2nd, 2022, the Sequoia National Forest brought on their, their, their um, organized crews. And these folks were local, local, local crews from Porterville. They began as firefighters for the Sequoia National Forest in 1925. Not the guys who were working, but the, but the crews themselves. For nearly 100 years, these dedicated firefighters have been a shining beacon on the hill, showing what true grit, commitment, and spirit can bring when people come together for the common good. That was a quote from the one of the four supervisors when the, the organization crews reached their 50th anniversary. The crews were working to protect the giant sequoia groves from the devastating effects of drought and wildland fire, working from the ground up. Okay. So they got right boots on the ground very quickly. And they we were called in early August. And um, we were tasked with supporting the public information messaging of the giant sequoia emergency response. Next slide. Okay. Um, the incident management team originally wanted to order all of those PIOs. Um, and then we re recommended that they order us. And that was just because somebody knew somebody and we're having a discussion and like they'd never heard of fire prevention teams. And so Stephanie was able to tell her what the types of things that we do. And um, we made sure that everybody on the team was actually a PIO also, or a PIO trainee. We had one trainee and we had one PIO one. The assisted, and we assisted with immediately with the media rollout of the, of the GSER project with one media tour and two public tours of the actual work on the ground. So these areas were closed to the public because of the work that was being done. And so we were able to do media and public tours, taking them out. And that was a time consuming effort to put that together. And our agency administrator, Paul, he did all of that work and they were extremely happy to have him there because he could see things from a different perspective, having, you know, working for the Forest Service as an administrator. We created several press releases and advisories. We were available to handle any local media press. We were able to visit the groves many times, documenting work, taking drone video footage, embedding with a crew with a Getty Images photographer. That was that took two, three days for one of our people. We also helped the Sierra National Forest. Margot Witt, who was our videographer and um, photographer, she drove over there and spent two days with them creating videos and working with the media about their grove that they were working with the emergency response. Okay, next. Um, and as you know, one of the fun parts of, of being on a fire prevention team is the brainstorming and coming up with your themes, your goals, or your, your objectives. And so for us, we came up with from the ground up because the sequoia trees are massive. And the incident management team wanted us to focus on the local fire crews who were doing the work from the ground up. So we divided our, our outreach into three sections. The first, well, it, it was kind of divided for us, but our, but our 
our um, our messaging was the first was safe access because first the crews had to go in and actually make the, the way into the groves safe because so many of the trees had been weakened or killed by by drought or other wildland fire. So the second phase was tame the flame. Once access to the groves was safe, workers clear, cleared fuel from around the larger sequoia by cutting the small trees and pulling away the downed logs, debris, and duff. Eventually, treatments will include the mechanical removing of fuels and prescribed burning. Organized crews remove surface and ladder fuels around the base of the giant sequoias. Phase three, which is going to be the ongoing phase, is sustain the groves from the ground up. And these long term plans will preserve these national treasures as a Forest Service works to complete six projects designed to protect and sustain the giant sequoia groves and hillsides around them. This could include prescribed burning every 10 years in some areas. The, one of the neatest things we did was we were able to have uh, Margot really focus on making videos. I'm not going to show any of the videos today, partly because I'm not sharing my screen, but also we do not have time. But if you'd like to have access to these videos, just let me know, um, or if we could figure out how to put them on the, the toolbox. But we got we got to spend so much time, or oh, go back, Steph. Oh, <laughs> we got to spend so much time <laughs> in the groves. Um, Ludi Bond, she spent a lot of time in the groves, and and um, Margot and, and uh, Carol, everybody paul it's i had to stay in the office of course being the team leader but that's okay but um but and we also had access to um the drone operators who were brought on for the project so that was just all perfect timing but we we did how do you see a sequoia from the ground up how do you kill how does fire kill a sequoia from the ground up but also you know it does kill from the top too but um, how do you save a sequoia from the ground up? And then we had a two minute uh, movie about the entire project. Next. Um, the postcards that we made were printed in house and distributed to the crew members to, to thank them for working from the ground up. Um, they could also be posted on social media, on the website. They could be handed out at meetings. Um, shared with families, office at the offices. It took a lot of time to get those photographs and logos, but it was incredibly worth it. If if it was just the staff there, they could have never had time to pull this off. But um, I think Stephanie even designed the stamp that went on this postcard <laughs> with a sequoia on it, and they were really popular. And we were able to print them in house and pass them out. Um, we didn't have access to a lot of printing because they were moving offices, but we found a way to, to do that. And it was it was just really, really neat. Next. And of course, social media is the way to go. Um, we provided the photos and content and videos for their social media Facebook page. Uh, that's the only one that they had except for Flickr. They did have a public Flickr account that we were able to put a lot of photographs on. Um, we also did a lot of research to find historic photographs. They had this massive pile of old photos in one of the district offices that we went through every single one to see if we could find anything that could work for the project. We also got online and looked at some historical photographs. Um, we weren't able to find much, but at least we looked for them. That was one of the things they wanted us to do. Uh, we did complete a schedule of posts on Trello. I had never used Trello before, so that was a neat um, web, if not website, I guess it's a website or app um, that you can schedule your posts. So we did that for them so they could have some stuff throughout the end. Okay, Stephanie. Um, the, the IMT wanted a way to show progress, so we created what we called the Monarch Meter, and this was part of the web. We were going to put it on the web page, um, 
And um, basically, uh, they counted every monarch tree that they that they um, were able to protect. And so we were we were wanting to show the public that we were making access or we were making progress. And so this was just another tool to to kind of show that the crews are working hard protecting this natural this national resource. OK, uh, our takeaway. One of the unique components of the prevention team was how we were integrated with the incident incident management team and the public affairs officer. We worked closely to make sure we were accomplishing their goals. Uh, we completed the traditional PIO tasks as well as introducing introducing them to the national fire prevention team, what they could provide for a forest and Emergency response, especially in California, can be a very political activity. And our goal was to work hand in hand with the IMT to behead, be ahead, <laughs> to behead, to be ahead of potential problems or issues. We also made sure that our team had the qualifications for this activity. So thank you so much for inviting us to talk about our experience. It was like a once in a lifetime experience to spend so much time on four of the 11 groves that they started to work on. Thanks for inviting us. Anybody have any questions or we, we wanna do that at the end? I'll tell you what, Cindy, we'll just do that at the end. We'll, okay. we'll go ahead and do all the presentations. So thank right. you, uh, Cindy and Stephanie. And okay, we'll go ahead and roll over to Miss Evelyn Morgan. Yes, I want to <laughs> thank you all for taking time out of your day to to uh, come to this presentation. I was honored with uh, being uh, the coordinating team in Portland, Oregon for the 2017 eclipse. Um, I'm sorry I didn't do a uh, PowerPoint, but with all the trouble that's been going on now, I'm kind of glad that I didn't. Um, Oregon was faced with the dilemma of having a, uh, a strip of um, the eclipse going across. It was 70 miles wide and it was going to go completely across uh, Oregon. Within that, there was national forest land, there was BLM land and lots of private and state land. So they had to come up with a plan to uh, alleviate or try to alleviate the potential for fire. So work actually began on this uh, uh, this assignment in uh, June of 2016. A group got together and they brainstormed every one of the worst case scenarios that they could think of. They brainstormed everything that could go wrong and made this gigantic list. And then that list was split up into different agencies and different partners that they would bring in to help try to mitigate these issues um, because they all had shared concerns. In June of 2017, a short team was put together to uh, complete the um, products that they had created because they had created a lot of fire prevention uh, products, um, many of them that uh, are still around today. Um, and uh, Robin, would you care to drop the uh, final report into the chat for people to look at? Because I do have that final report for you. I've got it. I'm going to give it a try. I've been having some issues, but I will post it on our website as well. Okay. And, I, and I can bring it up here uh, when you finish to let people take a look at it as well. Also, OK, also in June of 2017, they divided the state up into three regions. There was the uh, central, there was an eastern region and a western region of of this path of totality for the eclipse. So in each one of those areas, uh, it was decided um, by Lauren Maloney and Karen Curtis, who were the leads on getting all this, all of these nuts and bolts going together. They are just to be commended for the work that they put into this because it was a big challenge. But they decided that there would be three teams in the field and then one team in Portland coordinating the effort. Uh, work on the delegations of authorities began in early June 
uh, to get everything in place so this team could roll in and get and everything be there for them. Lauren and Karen actually uh, ordered all of the products in early June. They got the GPO uh, orders together and to have them to be delivered in, in early August. They also pulled in the uh, uh, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs to support uh, the effort also and also shared materials with them and also helped them to uh, develop some materials that they wanted for their use. Um, some of the lodging uh, logistics was put into place in early February because there was no hotels available for um, you know, for miles and miles away from the totality zone. Um, my team arrived on August the 18th, and prior to my team coming, there was a, a giant um, lightning storm went through the area and started uh, numerous fires. Um, there was plans for um, uh, about a thousand hikers to be in the uh, Mount Jefferson area. There was a fire that was in there, so that had to be uh, nixed. Uh, they had special use permit to be there, so the, the people had to find another location to go. Um, and smoke was an issue every far, everywhere. And at the same time, the Checo Bar fire got to rolling it was uh it even made a five mile run on a, a coastal city so the uh the forest service really had and the state of oregon and the blm really had their hands full with all the fire so my team which was made up of myself gwen hensley uh donna wilson was my pio and lidiana soto who had been there uh, she was taking some days off because she'd been there two weeks prior. She was responsible for getting all the materials delivered out to the field. The three team leaders were Cindy Frenzel, Judy Reese, and April Phillips. They had a total uh, of 17 people that was out in the field with them. My job was to coordinate with the team and keep everybody in the loop and gather the information. All the while, these fires are just ramping up. Um, they, uh, the state and the Forest Service and BLM, they had set up uh, JICs. They had emergency management people because one of the things that they were worried about, there was so many small towns within this uh, totality area that they knew that those towns could not handle the influx of people with the resources that they had. So they were looking at ways to uh, situate uh, resources in strategic points so that they could help these small towns in case the worst case scenario happened. The, uh, the field teams, they staggered their arrival so that they would be in place and uh, for the eclipse, and yet once the eclipse was over, they would be able to rotate out. Um, so on the day, um, our week, uh, we got there on the 18th, the uh, eclipse happened on the 21st, and from the 18th to the 21st, we spent a lot of time um, coordinating with the NEMO team that was there, uh, coordinating with emergency management, coordinating with uh, Forest Service Region 6, BLM, coordinating with all the players that was in this jigsaw puzzle. Um, on the 21st, we were outside the totality zone. We took the morning off because everywhere everyone was situated in their area. We had uh, little cell phone coverage. There was absolutely no internet co coverage for the teams that was out there. So we were, uh, we had requested in their DOAs that they were not to do daily reports. They were just to call us or text us the number of people that they had talked to that day. So on the 21st, um, the eclipse happened and not one human caused fire happened. Uh, the days prior to uh, the eclipse, the Burning Man uh, 
the Burning Man concert, there was supposed to be 30,000 people there, when in reality, it was more like 70,000 people showed up. There was traffic jams for hours and hours, hours leading into the Burning Man uh, music uh, festival. So, uh, but on the 21st, that day, we had no human caused fires. Uh, when we uh, had our after action review, I would like to quote for you what the NEMO team said. The NEMO team said one of the most notable successes was the fire prevention with no known human cause, no known human caused incidents evolving into any fires of significance. So we were really uh, happy with that. Um, but my job uh, with coordinating, uh, I was handling things like um, issues with people, uh, you know, their pay and that kind of stuff and getting the numbers and and all of uh, the logistics that goes into it. The front end planning, I cannot say enough about the quality of the front end planning for this event. Um, all, everyone was on their toes waiting for something to happen and it didn't. Um, and the teams that were out in the field, uh, they made 14,839 public contacts at 591 distinct locations. So this right here was one of the most successful prevention uh, team assignments I've been on and one of the most uh, not your typical assignment, but it was a lot of fun. A lot of hard work went into it. Any questions or comments, or do you want to save those to the end? We can just save them to the end and then do them all together. Okay. That'll work. Hope I didn't go too long. Yeah, we uh, got a um, message from Jared that he was on a fire as a heavy equipment boss and he got a really cool Smokey Bear sticker with the, uh, the Eclipse glasses on and the state of Oregon in the in the foreground. So I don't know if everybody's seen that or not. I'll, I'll go ahead and since I'm having problems, I'll go ahead and share the document just to have you take a look at it because I love this picture on here. Uh, there's the sticker with the glasses and the pie plate or the the paper plate. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, those there's, stickers were. There's the sticker. Yeah, even after the eclipse, as we were traveling home, there was people at the airport that they saw our stickers, you know, on our luggage and stuff, and they wanted uh, they wanted stickers and. Yeah, those are very sought after stickers, but I may know a few people that have a few of them. So uh, those are collector's items, definitely. It was so that was just yeah. so thought well thought out. You know, we figured that people wouldn't be able to have campfires at that time of the year. So they actually made trash bags with a great message on them that, you know, not to try to burn their trash, but to put it in that bag and take it home and, you know, gave them. Uh, if there had been, you know, uh, campfires, there was a campfire message on there, drown, stir, fill. I mean, everything was just really well, well thought out. And here in the document is a uh, graphic from the Portland National Incident Management Team Organization that shows you all the contacts that were made. 14,839 public contacts at 591 distinct locations. It's tremendous. Yes, it was a great effort. And like I said, you know, I was only a small part of that. Uh, but the the kudos really goes to Lauren Maloney and Karen Curtis and that whole team of people out there in Region 6 for supporting, you know, the prevention process on this. And it was really gratifying to hear Nemo, a Nemo team say that, it was very successful. So I kind of gave us, uh, you know, validation to what we do. And I think a lot of times um, agencies don't realize what, you know, uh, a prevention team can do to help them with a situation or an event. So uh, somehow we need to get the word out more about 
the kind of things that a prevention team can do. So I'm going to go now and let Karen get on here. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to contact. Okay, thanks Evelyn. Okay, up next is Karen Stafford. All right, thank you everybody. Um, those are some couple really tough presentations to follow, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I didn't realize until EJ mentioned in the previous presentation that Texas is must be the only state agency that orders in fire prevention teams. So um, I'm gonna do my best to uh, pay tribute to all the national fire prevention teams as well as our state fire prevention teams that we had last year. Uh, get this shared right quick. Okay, so um, Last year, our fire season uh, really got started up um, in the previous fall, but by March of 2022, uh, we really, really started seeing the need to bring in some fire prevention teams. Um, as a state agency, we do our best to manage uh, in-house as much as possible with fire prevention teams. But once we get spooled up in fire season, um, you know, just like any other state agency, a lot of our people, a lot of our resources get pulled into fire suppression efforts. Um, so we still do the best that we can though with what we have. Um, so when I talk about fire prevention teams in my presentation, I'm not just talking about the national teams we brought in, but also talking about our state teams, whether that be a two man team or four man team or whatever we were able to assemble at the time. Um, so what you see the map here is the amount of coverage we were able to um, to make the, the contacts with over this fire season. So starting from March, going through the end of August um, in Texas, we have 254 counties in Texas. And we were, with the help of these prevention teams, we were able to impact 115 of those counties across the state during that time frame. Um, and you can see kind of the quick numbers there in front of you of what we were able to accomplish, um, you know, 11 media interviews is what we track, but I'm sure we actually did a whole lot more than that. Um, you see the amount of events that were attended, the distribution sites, nearly 1,400 distribution sites, um, over 1,500 activities reported. Um, and of those prevention teams, the ones that were tracked, mainly the, the national prevention teams tracking their mileage, they drove over 40,000 miles across the state in their coverage areas making over 54,000 contacts with zero accidents or safety concerns. So that is extremely notable. Um, so huge kudos to all these prevention teams out there doing the work. Um, I guess I should say a, a part about my role that I played in this. Um, I'm not a prevention team leader, um, but in my normal everyday role as a state prevention coordinator for our agency, um, I was, I guess, more of the, the state administrator or the agency administrator, that liaison person to our state agency with these prevention teams. Um, I was the one uh, setting up where their um, where their coverage areas were gonna be, what kind of work needed to be done, um, who the cooperators were in those areas, things like that. There we go. So some of the tasks that these, all the prevention teams were their national state. Um, they were participating in public events, promoting our fire prevention messaging, um, reaching out, making contacts for larger events, um, things such as NASCAR, uh, Major League Baseball, hockey, college football, um, had some main, minor league baseball teams as well, visiting our Texas Parks and Wildlife State Parks, um, visiting private campgrounds, um, and utilizing our already existing state talking points and already our graphics that we had established for social media. Um, then these prevention teams use those talking points, those graphics, and shared them amongst the other media, chambers of commerce, civic organizations across the state, and asking their help in spreading the messages over their own social media channels. Um, for the reporting, they still did the, the traditional daily reports um, to me every day, but then also utilizing our survey one, two, three, and our prevention activity survey to log their daily activities, um, you know, dropping the GPS points of their distribution sites, tracking the number of contacts and things like that, able to also take photos of where they were going that day. And then each team, again, whether they were national or state, um, compiled a final closeout report and submitted to me at the end of their uh, activities. So the first team we had was a state team um, starting in March, going into the 1st of April. This was our Coastal Bend team. Um, and you'll notice um, on each of the following slides, I've 
put the team members that are on each of these teams to pay tribute to them. Um, and you will see Heather Gonzalez's name pop up quite a lot. So she is also in our department, um, Texas State and Forest Service, and works in fire prevention along with me. And she's located in South Texas. So um, this is this is her home territory to her. And so she's very passionate about this area. And so with our first prevention team, um, we brought in two more uh, agency employees to go down to South Texas and help her. And this is where they established the concept of the pop-up events. Um, this was a fun, a fun notion where they would just like randomly pop up at local events or just uh, local areas in the community where people were gathering for the day and set up a table, pass out information, talk to the people in the community. Um, and this was huge, huge benefit to us and something that we carried on throughout the rest of the year. Um, they also went to a lot of school events, um, and actually one of the schools that they attended and did a Smokey Bear program for was um, Ricardo Elementary, and they were actually under a voluntary evacuation at the time due to the Borrega fire. Um, so it was good that they were able to be in that community at that time during that voluntary evacuation. But they also is, visited all the county judges, commissioners, fire departments in this coverage area as well. Um, not only delivering the burn ban flags and traditional prevention supplies, but they also delivered a USB drive to, to all of these offices that, came, that contained all of our prevention materials, social media graphics and talking points so that they could then share those graphics across their own social media channels and help spread the word that way. So then our, our first national team was brought in at the very end of March and really going into the first half of April. Um, they were very different. They weren't just a traditional boots on the ground type of prevention team. This was more of a strategy team to help us. We knew, you know, looking at Texas for the long term that we were going to be in this for a while. So this was more of a strategy team. Um, their delegation of authority was very different in that it really identified three major objectives. First of all, they were going to develop a short term strategy for us. Um, in some in three specific branches of Texas, um, but then they also developed a long term strategy to help us get through the rest of the year um, and then helped us increase our collaboration with our internal and external partners. Um, now, in, in this strategizing that they did, they also continued with the pop up events. They continue to visit the state parks, um, but they also developed the business, the first version of the business card. Um, that became hugely popular with a QR code on it. Um, that QR code went to a link tree. Um, if you've never used a link tree, I highly suggest looking into it. Um, I'll get into a bit more of that at the very end of my presentation, but this was something that we continued through the rest of the summer. Um, at the end of the summer, we we redesigned it, put a new QR code on it, and, and this is something we're still continuing to use to this very day, but um, these business cards are just something easy you can pass out as you walk through large crowds. Uh, the public doesn't have to worry about handing, you know, handfuls of big pieces of paper. They can take these business cards, they can stick it in their wallet, stick it in their purse or their pocket, and, can, and keep up with it. Um, then going back down into South Texas, again with um, Heather, um, at this point we brought in two more single resource uh, prevention team members to help her um, continue with the pop-up events. They got Smokey to throw out the first pitch at the Corpus Christi Hooks baseball team, um, continued local distribution through all these counties, um, doing lots of media interviews as well. Um, that very bottom right picture you see with the prevention team member, the lady with him, she's um, actually, I believe she was the city mayor and she was so excited to have our prevention people there with her in her town, helping her during all this. Um, but this team, they visited in their, in their two weeks, they visited 68 private businesses, um, seven libraries with Smokey Bear readings, three schools, 10 fire departments, and 17 cooperators with local and state offices and agencies. So they did a lot of work in their short two weeks. And then moving into Central Texas, April, going into May, um, we had a two-man team that was that was all we were able to get at the time. So we made the most use we possibly could with them. Um, brought in a prevention team member from California to team up with one of our own agency employees. Um, and the agency employee was not even a fire staff. Um, he's actually a forester there in Central Texas, um, but he jumped at the opportunity to be able to help out with prevention. Um, but again, together, they kind of divided and conquered and, and got as much work done as they possibly could, attending those large events, um, passing out more of those 
those QR codes, those business cards. I can't tell you how many of those we had printed. We just kept hitting reprint on those with whatever local Office Depot store you can get them at. Um, and then the pet safety kits. This was a, a new, unique idea that we started in Central Texas um, to where we pre-assembled kits, um, you know, Smokey Bear plastic bags that had pet um, evacuation information in it. Um, how to prepare your pets for an evacuation, and then how to safely evacuate with your pets. But then in that, we also included prevention business cards, the prevention rec cards, ready, set, go materials for the for the owners, the homeowners as well. Um, and then we always put in a, a fun bandana for the dogs as well. Um, and then these kits were distributed um, to adoption and rescue facilities all across Central Texas. And these people, they loved getting these kits for pets um, because sometimes the pets kind of get forgotten in that evacuation process in these areas. So um, anyway, that was something new that we just tried and it was hugely popular. And again, that's something that's definitely going on my list of things to do in future prevention teams. And then July and into August, we brought in our second national team, our Florida guys. Um, and this was uh, just, again, a very unique situation, um, you know, talking to the prevention team leader ahead of time being Patrick Mahoney. And, and we showed him the coverage area that we wanted him to cover in his with his team. And um, he was actually the one that said, you know, there's no way we can do this with a standard size prevention team. I'm going to need more people. And so we basically told him, well, bring however many people you think you need to get this done because we need the work. <laughs> um, so he actually doubled his team size when he brought them in. Um, one of them was was Spanish speaking. So that was, again, very, very beneficial to us in Texas. Um, and then we attached Heather to their team just so they would have an agency representative on their team. Um, because that, again, has just proved to be very beneficial in the past. But together, this team, they continued with the pop-up events. They helped plan for large events. Um, even if they weren't able to staff those large events, um, they at least, um, you know, they paved the way for our agency to come in and staff it after they were gone. Um, and one of those was the um, Texas Rangers baseball game. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, they also created, I think it ended up being um, about 16 video PSAs for us in English and Spanish with a whole variety of topics using our Smokey Bear Robotronic truck. And so that was a lot of fun as well. Um, and since they had Nacho on their team, and uh, since he is bilingual, this was actually the first time we were able to offer to the media outlets and let them know that we did have somebody Spanish speaking that could do Spanish speaking interviews. Um, and so that was, um, again, a huge benefit to us. But what this did with this team, um, bringing in a double size team, working in two locations to split up their coverage area, this really set the precedent of what we would use throughout the rest of the summer. Then also at the same time, we had a team in East Texas. And again, these were not fire staff. These were foresters. Uh, Michelle is actually, she works in sustainable forestry. Donna is a wildlife biologist. And then Brett and David both are FIA foresters in Northeast Texas. And so um, as a four-man forester slash fire prevention team, um, they split up. We had the, the two gentlemen working in Northeast Texas and then the two ladies working in Central East Texas with me. Um, but again, continue with the pop-up events. They went to all the farmer's markets that they possibly could. Um, they actually were the ones that attended the Rangers baseball game that the Florida team had, had greased the wheels for. And then everywhere they went, we hit these mini libraries. So these are the free little mini libraries that people have in their neighborhoods, scattered around communities. Um, my kid's pediatrician has one outside her doctor's office. Um, so these are the take a book, leave a book type of things. And so we hit every mini library we possibly could across these communities, leaving Smokey Bear storybooks, comic books, activity books, um, just anything we could do to get the word out about fire prevention to any audience. Um, the next up, our next national team was the Georgia team. Um, and again, when we showed them the coverage area and we went ahead and told this team, be prepared to bring double the amount of people because <laughs> you're going to have a large area and be, be prepared to work from two different duty stations. And so they did the same thing as the Florida guys. Um, and you can see they, again, they attended a baseball game. Uh, it was the Round Rock Express minor league team. They threw out the first pitch with Smokey Bear. Um, staying locally engaged with the libraries at community centers. Smokey Bear appeared in 
it was either two or three parades acting as the Grand Marshal, working with the fire departments in that effort, and then also um, visiting iconic Texas landmarks. And it doesn't get more iconic in Texas than the Alamo. And so they actually spent a full day with Smokey and the Texas Rangers at the Alamo talking to visitors, um, spreading our fire prevention messages. And, you know, a lot of these iconic landmarks, these um, tourist destinations, you have people traveling into the area, then they're traveling back home. So that's the perfect time to talk about things like roadside starts, chain dragging, driving on flat tires. So that was a lot of the messaging that they, they spread at that location there. Um, and so, um, I want to spend a little bit more time. I talked a little bit about Survey 123 in my presentation yesterday, um, but I want to just show you kind of how it works on my end and what I get to see and the benefit of this. Um, so Survey 123, um, everybody can have it downloaded to the phone, the iPad, take it with them in the field. Um, they're collecting data in real time. Uh, they're dropping those GPS points wherever they're visiting. And so this is what I get on my end. Um, as a coordinator, I get this really cool looking dashboard. So I'm immediately seeing how many activities they're having, their number of contacts. I can I can sort it by if I want to just focus on a specific county and see what they're targeting in that specific county. I can filter my date range. Um, so for this purpose, I've selected the full date range of when we had all of those fire protection teams active from March through September of last year. And so it kind of looks like uh, Texas has a some sort of a nasty disease with like blue chicken pox or something, but um, those are all the distribution sites, all the activities that were collected during this time. Um, it lets me see what kind of deliverables they were using, whether it be flyers, press releases, um, burn ban flags, whatever they were handing out. Um, I can also see the topics that are being addressed, um, what they're talking about while they're out in the field. I can see their method of contact, how many presentations they're giving, um, how many phone calls they're making, interviews, information booths, um, all that kind of stuff. And then I can see in each county how many contacts are being made. As I scroll through here, you can see, and then at the very bottom in Kamal County had the highest number of contacts with 51. Um, and then I can also enlarge the map of Texas to see what's going on. And, and this is what I particularly like is because I can go in and I can see, okay, this, this particular area is being completely saturated at this point. Let's move on. Um, it also helps prevent duplication of work uh, for when the next team comes in, but you can scroll into areas. Um, let's see where I can go. These uh, keep separating out the closer and you go, but I can click on the dot and I can see exactly where they were at, what business, what city, the date, um, what kind of contact method was made, what they gave out, how many contacts they made. Um, and if they take a photo at the site, it also shows up in this box as well. You can just kind of zoom around. Oh, here's this one has a photo. So again, I can see that which park they were at, the city they were in, the date, um, they were passing out flyers, they made contact with one person, and here's a picture of the park. Um, and so, you know, I can keep up with this. Like I said, it, it's real time, uh, it's statewide, it's, you know, whatever time frame I want to look at. So this is really great for us. And then the other thing I wanted to show it a little bit more detail about was Linktree in case you've never used this. Um, so the way Linktree works is this is a free account, so anybody can use it. Um, uh, there are, of course, paid features you can get, but this is all we have is a free account. Um, and I can go in here, I can add as many links as I want. Um, I can change, I can take them out, I can put new ones in, I can change the order of them. And then what you see over here on the right, um, this is what it's going to look like on your phone when you bring it up. Um, I can completely customize this with the background. I can put in whatever thumbnail pictures I want down here. Um, so the the ones that we keep in here are kind of our, our current situation, our current wildfire situation, a link to our burn ban map, our prevention page on our website, um, the home mitigation page on our website. Um, but then also have in here a direct link to our Twitter for incident information, and then also our wildfire education and prevention Facebook page. Um, and then as situations change, I can add to this, I can take things out, I can change the links, um, and I never have to change the QR code. So all those business cards that we have printed, the QR code does never have to change. I can change everything behind the scenes on it. 
And so it's really easy to update. Um, and so this is something that we will continue to use. Like I said, those business cards, they're cheap to print. Um, they're easy to maintain. They're easy to hand out at large events. Um, and really the people enjoy getting that a whole lot more than say like a large rack card or a large brochure or something, a, you know, a big bulky piece of paper they have to try to keep up with. Um, and this is something they can just stick in that wallet. And then if they're in an area where they might be having a burn ban, they can pull that card out, scan the QR code, go straight to our burn ban map. Um, just makes things a lot easier for us to keep up with. Um, so that's that's all that I have. If we have any questions. Okay, any questions? We've got it. Uh, yeah, EJ has got her hand up. Go ahead, EJ. I believe that was Ludi with her hand up. I do not. Okay. Oh, I don't know how my hand got up. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. I I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, I was the one that was with the uh, the mayor. We were all the way down in very south Texas. Um, you know, right on the pretty close to the Mexico border. We were we me and Rocker did not know Spanish. I know enough just to get myself in trouble, but. Uh, we both knew the culture, so while we were there, mm -hmm. we kind of um, talked with one of the grandmothers of the biggest family there, and then that's how we got in with the rest of the people at the whole event. So I know they're going to talk about it more later, but I definitely learned a lesson there is to just know the culture you're going into, and that can really help you out a lot. Go ahead, Caroline. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to know um, if the survey one, two, three is part of your normal ArcGIS package, or is that something you have to get additionally? Um, Caroline, I'm I'm sorry, I am not the one to answer that. I am not an ArcGIS person at all. Um, but I will. I can ask that question, and I can definitely get you an answer after that. That that would be awesome, yeah, because I'm getting more into ArcGIS. I'm going to like a workshop for it next week, and I just um, I'm not familiar with the surveying tools of GIS, and and I find like especially in prevention, all of those features are are amazing. So I'd love to know more. Yeah, um, I've made note of your name, and I'm gonna find out for you, and I'll let you know for sure. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I'm not the brains behind RGIS or the survey one, two, three. Um, I just know how great it is in the field, so I'll find out for you. Thank you. Ludi, yes. you still have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment on with the 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 um presentations that we just had and some other things we've been talking about in the last 24 hours. It's just amazing how flexible um fire prevention teams can be. I mean, when what Cindy and Stephanie were talking about how actually the team came in and we um helped with capacity for that public affairs officer with the giant sequoia emergency response. So that that's, you know, how we acted in, in that capacity. And then what um, with with eclipses and teams coming in and I mean, we're just so versatile and so flexible. I remember the year before in 2021, I was with a prevention team with Cindy Frenzel out at the last volcanic. I mean, the last national park, national forest, excuse me. And we actually had a couple of PIOs um, go and help an emerging wildfire nearby. They needed some PIOs quick to man the phone booth, so phone bank. So we quick grabbed a couple of PIOs off the prevention team and had them go over and help that fire out until they could get their resources um, in the door and, and get them checked in. So it's just truly amazing that 
how flexible and versatile prevention teams can be. And I think more and more we're, we're starting to see that capability. And so I just had a comment. Go ahead, Gwen. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, I agree that it's great that we're flexible. I just, um, since I've been doing this for so many years, I just really want to make sure though that we do understand that when we go out on a fire prevention team, we need to be emphasizing a fire prevention message. And if we, um, you know, when we start, um, when we, we need to be cautious if we do send resources to fires and other places, you know, there's a whole nother resource order that probably needs to be cut um, for for being in that position and knowing that we're assigned to that incident. Um, and then also just to try to help the system to promote fire prevention teams um, so that people know that we're not just, um, we're, we're, we can assist with information, but we really should be focusing on fire prevention. That That's just my, my take from all the years I've been working with them. Okay, any other comments or questions for our group, our panel here? Um, I just wanted to um, to say back to Caroline, if you saw Bruce Wood's comment that he had just confirmed with our agency's GIS folks that the Survey 123 is included with the ARC GIS. Thank you. I just want to make sure you saw that. Thank you. Go ahead, Andy. Robin, just as a quick reminder, everyone, before we break for lunch, please stay logged in to the Teams account so they can get you into the breakout rooms for the next session. Thank you. Yes, I want to definitely make sure that everybody gets in their assigned breakout. Okay, anything else? Yeah, good presentation, everyone. So we are right at lunch. So what we're going to do is go ahead and break for lunch now.